Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and proud JOMA member. And today, I'm really honored and really excited to be here today with Dr. Paul Offit. Dr. Offit should really need no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. And before I do that, I will say, please, if there's a topic you want to hear, you want to be interviewed, you know someone you want to be interviewed, you have comments on the interviews, please reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at joma.org. We want to hear from you. Dr. Paul Offit is director of the Vaccine Education Center and an attending physician at the Division of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is the Maurice R. Hilleman Professor of Vaccinology at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an internationally recognized expert in the fields of virology and immunology and was a member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He is a member of the FDA, Federal Drug Administration, Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee and a founding advisory board member of the Autism Science Foundation and the Foundation for Vaccine Research, a member of the Institute of Medicine and co-editor of the Foremost Vaccine Text, Vaccines. He is a recipient of rewards, awards that are just too many for me to list, just a page of them, literally. I'm going to skip them. He is also the author of eight medical narratives, eight books, which have received numerous awards. I'm not going to list all eight of them. I will mention the two most recent, which are Bad Advice or Why Celebrities, Politicians, and Activists Aren't Your Best Source of Health Information, 2018, and You Bet Your Life, From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccination, The Long and Risky History of Medical Innovations from 2021. Welcome, Dr. Offit. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for asking me. It's my pleasure. Oh, it is such an incredible honor, as I explained to you. Um, I want to talk to begin with about your book, You Bet Your Life, which came out in the middle of the pandemic. I'd love to know why you wrote it. I will say that, you know, just to summarize it, it's about the promise and the risk of medical innovations, which are proceeding at warp speed nowadays pun intended, Um, but there's a major catch, right? And this is what you wrote. Virtually every medical breakthrough has exacted a human price. So I have to say that that made me pretty anxious reading that right as the vaccines were coming out. (laughs) I'd love to hear why you wrote the book then. Well, I think um, one of the impetuses for the book was, so I'm on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. So in December of 2020, we ultimately were tasked with authorizing or, or advising authorization of, you know, the two mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And um, early on, I mean, here was a virus that was isolated sequenced in January of 2020, but, but, and obviously we were going to be going, it was likely we were going to be going this messenger RNA vaccine route. And I just was listening to some of the CEOs of those companies, whether it was Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson saying, when they were really early in phase one, maybe they'd vaccinated 10 people, 15 people talking about how they could make tens of millions of doses. And I'm thinking, how about a little humility here? Because every medical innovation is associated with a price. And I think with that kind of inspired me in some ways to kind of go through the history of medical innovation, or at least key medical innovations, the big ones, you know, vaccines, anesthesia, uh, gene therapy, et cetera, to show that there's always a learning curve. In fact, the book was originally called The Learning Curve. Mm. Um, I think for, the, for that reason, humility, I think, should, should rule in things like this. Right. In all fairness, you did start writing it before the pandemic, right? That's right. No, it's, it's, it, I did, yes. And then it sort of, then the pandemic hit and it was further inspiration, you know. Yeah, because I, I found it very interesting to reread it, you know, a couple of years out when we have officially, pandemic is technically officially over now, right? And reading the description of COVID. And I think we forget how scary it was when it first started. And yeah, sure. I, yeah I want to know from you, I want to know from you, how much, you know, the way COVID seems to me now, it seems to be like 
overall milder. How much could we credit that to um, changing in the virus, um, natural immunity, vaccines? I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Right. So, so when the virus first came into this country, you know, in, in, in early 2020, we didn't have anything. We had zero population immunity. No one had been naturally infected. No one had been vaccinated. with a year of that. And no monoclonal antibodies, no antivirals, no vaccine. And so you saw what happened. I mean, this, this virus just took over the healthcare system. I mean, we couldn't do, at our hospital, we couldn't do elective surgeries. We were just taking care of three-fours of COVID patients. And we're at children's hospital. And children are less likely to be severely ill than adults. But um, yeah, it was, it was over overwhelming how much this was now, now now you probably have 96 percent population immunity from vaccination or natural infection or both so it's a little hard to determine the virulence of the current strains it is harder um it, it does appear that the omicron variant is less likely to cause um uh long covid but again it's very hard to do those studies because you can't find naive hosts you can't find people who who have never been exposed to the virus and have never been exposed to a vaccine Right, and I would think that the people left who haven't been vaccinated and and haven't had it might be very different than most people. Yeah, it'd be hard to find them. I really right. do think it'd be hard to find somebody who's never been vaccinated, never been naturally infected. Right, and even if you found them, would they be typical is what I'm saying. They That's may have something very sure. different about them. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They've been hiding in their room for the last you know, three years. Right. So back to that human price, I want to know what you think. What human price did the COVID vaccines demand? That's for a hard question. I'm vaccine. sorry, but I'm asking it anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, for the mRNA vaccines, the price was small. I mean, I, I you're always wait. The, the, the question isn't whether or not there's going to be a serious side effect. The, the only question is how serious and how rare. But that that's the only question. Because everything that once you get into a population of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people, you're going to find that there's a a serious side effect. And the answer was not terribly serious and relatively rare. So, so the, the big one for the mRNA vaccines was myocarditis, you know, inflammation of the heart muscle, um, which wasn't anticipated because they never are. I mean, those serious side effects virtually never are anticipated. So, and, and it was rare sort of generally from the population in all, in total, it was about one in 50,000 for the, the highest risk groups, which were boys and young men around sort of 16, 17 years of age, it could be as high as one in 6,600. For young children, children five to 11 years of age, close to one in 500,000. So it's extremely rare. And it was mild, a generally mild, self-resolving phenomenon. So I think the price paid for, for the mRNA vaccines was really, really small. Uh, the J&J's vaccine, you know, the viral vector vaccine, the price was bigger. Um, it was probably about one in 200,000 could get a blood clotting problem that could be serious, meaning a blood clot of the brain. And there were a handful of fatalities, deaths associated with that vaccine. That wasn't true for the mRNA vaccines. I don't know of any deaths from the mRNA vaccine because the myocarditis was so mild. Right. Yeah, we were uh, very fortunate, right? <laughs> In yes, terms of, but, you know, the price, I do think that there was a price, and I think the price is in, in distrust. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, I think we had a lot to learn about how to communicate this, this, this the virus and the disease to the public. I, I think the, the distrust started, at least for me, in, in mm -hmm. the Trump administration, when um, I think that the, the former president was looking for a magic cure. And I think when hydroxychloroquine was promoted by people like Stella Emanuel or this guy Didier Raoult at, uh, in France as being a wonder drug for this, uh, this uh, virus, um, there was no good evidence that that was true. There was no reason to believe it would be true. Nonetheless, the Trump administration successfully uh, twisted the arm of the Food and Drug Administration to authorize the use of that drug. And very quickly, studies were done to show that it didn't work to either treat or prevent COVID. And so three months after the authorization, they withdrew that authorization. And there were some fatalities associated with hydroxychloroquine because it can cause cardiac arrhythmia, mm -hmm. heart arrhythmia. So anybody who watched that had to, at some level, lose trust. And, and, and I'm talking about people in the medical community. I'm not just talking about the general public. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you because you saw what happened as we approached the end of 2020, you know, this was an election year. So there was a, you know, the election was going to be November 3rd or whatever. And, and, and again, uh, former President Trump was really pressuring the FDA to get that vaccine out before the election, which would have meant you wouldn't have had the requisite two-month follow-up after the last dose 
to make sure that there wasn't an issue with safety. He was trying to push the FDA to do that. And people at that point didn't trust the FDA. And so you had at least 10 states that formed their own vaccine advisory committees. They didn't trust us. Wow. They didn't trust the FDA's vaccine advisory committee, even though I would argue we are independent of the administration and independent of the industry. But they didn't trust. Imagine that. Imagine if it had come to that. Now, to, to, the, um, to the credit of the FDA commissioner at the time, who was Stephen Hahn, he really stood up to, to Trump. He did. And then Trump pulled him into his office in an invective laden tirade just tore into him and said, I want this vaccine out before the, the election. And he stood up and, and, and that didn't happen. So, the, so it was a month later, you know, after the ballots had already been cast. And so I give the FDA credit for that. But I think there was a lot lost in that. And that was just the beginning. I do right. think there were also mistakes made in the Biden administration that caused people to lose trust, including me. Uh, I, not and lose trust, but I certainly lost a little faith the way that these played out. And I'll give you an example for the Biden administration. When... Um, President Biden stood up in front of the American public on August 18th of 2021 and said, as of the week of September 20th, 2021, we, the administration, are going to be offering a booster dose for everybody over 16. What? Where did that come from? I, I mean, first of all, that's not the way it works. Go to the FDA first and make sure that that's a regulatory agency, that they say okay with that, and then go to the CDC to see if based on data they recommend that, because that was contrary to the CDC's own data, which at that point, which was sort of before Omicron came in, two doses seemed to be working fine for all age groups. So, And so there were people at the FDA that quit after that. Two prominent people that quit right. the FDA when he did that, because what you saw, again, you saw the administration going around these advisory committees and federal agencies to just do what they wanted. So therefore, it had become politicized, and that really upset people. Right. right. That's a big factor. Also, what about the whole thing with the masks, right? At the very well, beginning, masks, masks work. They do work. I mean, the, obviously, the 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 N95 masks work best. The KN95s, right. work, but you're talking about you know decreasing your chance of getting the virus or your chance of spreading the virus it, it, with those kinds of masks in this sort of 90 percent range. When you get to the side of the surgical mask, that you know rectangular mask that doesn't fit as well, um, it's not. It's imperfect. But it, it, it is valuable. Right, it right. That's not actually what I meant. I, I meant the other way around. And I remember in the beginning, they were saying, oh, don't you don't have to oh, buy those masks. You don't have to have masks. And they weren't even explaining that it was airborne. There's been yeah. mixed messaging on masks to the point of, I don't know if you've seen the <laughs> meme with Fauci, different things he said in the at all. Well, also, <laughs> anybody who's commented, and I'm including myself in this, anybody who's commented on this virus or this disease or this this vaccine early in this pandemic was wrong at some right. point. Right. You learn as you go. And I think exactly. um, we, I think Dr. Fauci was, I mean, remember it, it, people thought that there was a, a sort of fecal oral spread that you should, if you go to the grocery store, you right. should clean everything off, wash services, because the notion there was sort of hand mouth stuff. And it really was almost solely respiratory. Yeah, no, you're right. Masks worked. And I think we didn't uh, get that out early enough. So again, and I think with obviously, I think uh, unknowingly, um, with, with the mandates for vaccines or mandates right. for masking, we leaned into a libertarian left hook, and, and right. I think it's uh, really hurt us. Right, especially with also not taking natural infection into account. Yeah, I was actually part of a meeting that, uh, I remember that meeting, it was in February 2021, so I guess it was right around the time, no, no, it was later than that, I think. But in any case, the, 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 so I can tell you that the administration was considering it. They were considering saying, in this setting, because we're starting to mandate vaccines, if someone comes in a workplace or hospital or whatever and says, you know, I don't want to get vaccinated, but I've been naturally infected, and I think natural infection will prevent me from getting serious disease, therefore I don't want to get a vaccine, there's every reason to believe that natural infection would prevent against serious disease. Um, and the data came out fairly soon showing that that was true. But so the administration, I think, for more reasons having to do with bureaucratic right. uh, concerns, because this added another layer, you had to now prove that you were naturally infected. You could probably buy, you know, a PCR positivity card off the internet. So you really would have to show that your antibody, that you had antibodies to, um, you know, to like, uh, to, to, to the viral, viral proteins. And um, that was just another layer that they just didn't want to consider. Because at the time, you know, you're talking about 3000 people dying a day, let's just get this vaccine out there. Right, right. It's hard to remember being back at that time, right? There was a, it was you know three thousand four thousand deaths a yeah. day. We were overwhelmed by that virus, and 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 I tell you, in our hospital and in the adult hospital next door, virtually all those admissions were in people who were unvaccinated. 
who had chosen not to be vaccinated. Right. And I think also at the beginning, we were really hoping that the vaccine would prevent transmission. Right. I don't know why we were hoping that. <laughs> why did we hope that? But we. But, I, I, I think it would. De I think you know for, this is a short incubation period mucosal infection, right. like rotavirus, which is the virus that I worked on, or um, or influenza, or respiratory syncytial virus. But for short incubation period diseases, you're not going. Even the best vaccine or previous infection isn't really going to prevent you well from having mild disease six months after your last exposure, or certainly transmission. But it lessens it, but it doesn't uh, eliminate it. Right, but I think that was also a failure of communication of public health, right? Mike, I think that the, the, if I had to pick the single biggest failure, I, I think in December 2020, when we considered the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, those vaccines were 95% effective at preventing mild, moderate, or severe disease. There's no way protection against mild disease was going to last at that high right. level. Not possible because protection against mild disease is mediated by antibodies and antibodies will fade after three to six months. That had to fade. And six months later, that's exactly what you saw. Protection against severe disease was still in the 90% range, but protection against mild disease for those who'd been vaccinated six months earlier was around 50%. That had to happen. And I think we didn't make that clear to people. And, and I, uh, the CDC actually, you know, I think had a, in my mind, a communications error here because there was a, there was an outbreak in Provincetown, Massachusetts in July of, uh, of uh, 2021. Thousands of men get together, celebrate the July 4th holiday, 79% are vaccinated. Nonetheless, there's an outbreak of COVID. So uh, among uh, uh, 346 people who, despite being vaccinated, got COVID, four of those 346 were hospitalized. It's a hospitalization rate of 1.2%, which is a, a vaccine working very, very well. The remaining 342 had mild or asymptomatic infections, which the CDC labeled in their report, morbidity and mortality weekly report, their data, their language, breakthrough infections. That's a terrible word. Breakthrough implies failure. This, this wasn't a failure. This was a success. And, you, and the media picked that up very quickly because I, I occasionally was on, uh, on CNN and, and they I remember one episode where they were talking about uh, Brett Kavanaugh as part of a routine screening exam was was positively asymptomatic COVID. He'd been vaccin vaccinated, had an asymptomatic infection. He wins. But the way the media carried that is breakthrough infection. You would have thought he was fighting for his life. Right. So that that's another piece of it also. Um, I want to talk a little bit about risk benefit assessment, right? Because I think one of the problems is that it was a one size fits all set of policies. So say you have a young kid, say a teenage male, right? And there is that increased risk in that age group of the myocarditis side effect, correct? So That's say that kid has had, right. had it's, COVID it's already. Second dose, yeah. Within right? Four different dose too, right. Yeah. So say the kid has had COVID already, or say he's had COVID in one dose, and we're told, ignore the ignore the COVID and just keep vaccinating. Is that a fair risk assessment for this particular kid? No, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fair point. But again, you've learned this in retrospect. I, I would like to say just in, in defense of the medical system <laughs> and public health people and people who are right. trying to educate that you certainly knew there was a study out of Kentucky showing that if you were um, naturally infected and then you got two doses of vaccine, you clearly enhanced immunity. Not surprisingly, you get hybrid immunity, you broaden immunity, you lengthen immunity, certainly for protection against severe disease. So that's good. I think that the final, as the dust settles on this pandemic, I think you can say that if you're healthy and less than 75, if you've had three doses of an mRNA containing vaccine or two doses of a vaccine and a natural infect, you probably have, you probably may not need boosters for years, uh, frankly, because you still are going to be protected against severe disease. You're not protected against mild disease for very long, but you're protected against severe disease. But again, I think that, um, you know, you learn these things over time. But but no, I agree with you. I mean, even today, there are some college campuses or universities that um, insist on people getting a, you know, these basically young, healthy people, 18 to 22, 22 years of age, they have to get another dose of vaccine before they come on campus. That doesn't right. make any sense. Right. You're that right. happened to my son, hot off Omicron, right? <laughs> Once they finally let him out of isolation in this hotel for like a month. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and he is very distrustful now and it's understandable, right? It, it didn't make sense. Most colleges don't do this. Most universities don't do this. Our hospital doesn't do this. Our hospital takes care of a vulnerable population of children, many of whom can't be vaccinated. We, we don't uh, mandate a booster dose. Right. Do we still have mandates out there? I think there are still some, I asked one of the reporters called me about this, and that surprised me too. She said, yes, there are still some colleges and universities that mandate a booster dose before you can get back on campus. 
I knew it was true for the spring semester. I just didn't know it was coming through for the upcoming semester. Wow, wow. So um, I, I do think, though, that different people will do risk benefit assessments in a different way. I think people have different risk tolerances, both for doing something and for doing nothing. Um, and I wanted to know your thoughts on that in terms of communication. Well, doing nothing is doing something. Okay. Is, there are no okay. risk choices. Okay. A choice not to get a vaccine is a choice to take a different risk. And I would argue more serious risk. I mean, you know, you know, now that we have, you know, billions of people who literally billions of people who've received this vaccine, you have a very good sense of what it can and can't do in terms of efficacy and what, what problems there are regarding safety. You know that. Um, if you if you've never been vaccinated and you've never been naturally infected, you should get vaccinated. I mean, that's clear. There's 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 I mean, you could argue you never need mandates. I mean, anybody who looks at the data who hasn't been vaccinated and, and may not have been naturally infected should get a vaccine. So to me, that's clear. Uh, but you're there. You always take a risk. There's no risk free choice. I think people assume that when they don't that, that, that a choice not to get a vaccine is 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 a choice, a choice. It, that is a choice to do right. something. It's a choice to put yourself at risk. Right, but I find that a lot of people perceive doing something, if something happens when they do something, they would feel much worse about it than when they don't do something and something happens. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. <laughs> I deal with that all the time as a pediatrician. You know, we worked on the rotavirus vaccine. I mean, the um, at the time, that before there was a rotavirus vaccine in this country, which was around 2006, um, there were 75,000 hospitalizations every year from rotavirus severe dehydration associated with this intestinal virus, and about anywhere from 20 to 60 deaths a year. So people say, that's not that big of a deal, um, you know, but, but if you, a choice not to vaccinate your baby was, it, it, certainly before there was a vaccine, it was a real choice to suffer that disease. Everybody suffered that disease by two years of age. So, so that was a, a choice not to get a vaccine was a choice to suffer the disease. Now you may get away with it. You may not be hospitalized and you may not die, but you might. So why ever take that risk? And, you know, people, it's like saying, you know, most people in car accidents walk away, but they're lucky. You know, it's not like, you know, um, that the, there's not consequences to taking risks and why make yourself vulnerable when you don't need to. It, the, the thing is, is you're right. We, we, it's like the sin of omission versus the sin of commission. I think mm -hmm. if we do something to our child, give them a vaccine and there's a, a negative consequence. You know, we, we, we feel guilty. We've done something that harms them. On the other hand, if you don't give a vaccine and the child is hospitalized or worse, um, that is also a choice that you made. And, and, and it, it's, you know, it, for, for children who die, let's say the parent chooses not to give a pneumococcal vaccine and the child then dies of meningitis or sepsis. Um, that's a choice. And, you know, it's, there, it, it's, it, it's equal. It, it's the, 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 the notion that, um, that there's a difference in, in, in a serious outcome, whether you've made the choice or you haven't made the choice, it's still a serious outcome. Right. But I also think that the way people look at something new is they say, is it safe? And I think for some people, when they hear safe, they want to hear 100% safe. When you say it's safe and they hear something happened to somebody, they say, well, you lied to me. You told me it was safe. There's an expectation of 100%. But the whole basis of your book, right, is things that are new have some unknown risks. Yeah, so the, the term safety, at least in the medical sense, is, is that the benefits clearly outweigh the risk. Uh, anything in medicine, whether it's a biological like vaccines or it's a drug it, that has a positive effect will have a negative effect. I mean, if it's never had a negative effect, it probably never had a positive effect. So that's always the trade-off. The question is, did the, the benefit, if the benefits clearly and definitively outweigh the risks, then that's considered safe. Um, but nothing's absolutely safe. Of course, that's true. So, so you try and make your best cho choice based on risks and benefits. And regarding COVID, the choice was easy. I couldn't wait to get vaccinated. I mean, you know, there was a chance that I could have suffered because I'm older. So pericarditis, meaning inflammation of the, uh, the lining of the heart, not so much myocarditis, but, you know, both are possible. But, you know, the virus was raging. You know, I, I was taking care of children with COVID and was unvaccinated. <laughs> Hard. Right, right. And I, I don't think it's fair to assume that the virus is so significantly milder, it may just be an effect of our overall immunity. Would that be a fair thing to say that we just don't know? Sure. I, I mean, one almost 1 1.2 million people have died from this virus in this country. 1,700 children, meaning children less than 18 years of age, have died from this virus. We certainly had a handful of deaths in our, in our hospital from this virus. I mean, of course you can die. I, I, now it's things are much better. I, I, obviously, 
if you define pandemic as something that changes the way we live, work, or play, we're past this pandemic. People aren't scared of this virus anymore. They've grandfathered it in. They've grandfathered in like they've grandfathered influenza, grandfathered in respiratory syncytial virus, which is to say this virus will now join the pantheon of winter respiratory viruses that cause hundreds of thousands of people to be hospitalized and tens of thousands to die every year. But you still can die of this virus. So if you've never been naturally infected or vaccinated, the choice is easy, but that's not most people. It's, it's the rare person who I think has not been naturally infected or vaccinated. You could argue natural infection should protect well against severe disease, assuming you're healthy and young. Right. So I'm a, I'm a pediatrician. So I'm going to go back to the younger kids, because what I find to be the, the challenging age group for talking about the COVID vaccine is primarily the six to 24 month age group. And those are the ones who may not have had it, right? Especially the six month olds. Then I want to hear your answer to that. Sure. I am a new <laughs> grandfather. Congratulations. I three month old granddaughter. <laughs> um, when that child is six months old, so her mother um, was vaccinated. Um, therefore, she will passively transfer antibodies to her baby that will protect that baby for about six months. But at six months of age, assuming the baby has not been infected, which is likely, and assuming that those antibodies will have worn off, which is actually a fact, um, that baby is now vulnerable and that virus still circulates. I hope I will certainly do everything I can to influence them to vaccinate that baby because, because the vaccine is safe meaning that, it, that its benefits clearly outweigh what are very rare risks. And um, therefore that will confer to her protection, which will likely last for years. I, I think you know she will only, I think, probably get three doses of the vaccine and be protected for years. And I will feel much better about this because this virus is going to, the, the pandemic's over, but the virus isn't over. I mean, we're, we're gonna be dealing with this virus for decades. We, you know. We've been dealing with influenza since the mid 1300s. I mean, the, even if the whole world was vaccinated, even if this virus never created variants, this virus has still been spread because it's a short incubation period, mucosal infection. So I, I sure hope she gets vaccinated. I am very comfortable about that. Now, I don't know the degree to which my son or daughter-in-law listen to me, but hopefully they will and get- That's what I want an update on three months from now. <laughs> I know my kids don't always listen to me. So. I don't. I don't want her walking around unprotected, and, and right. she will be unprotected uh, when she's six uh, from six months of age on. And and yeah, I guess I've seen. You know, I guess we all are experience, uh, influenced by our experience. But I work in a hospital, so and here's a virus that when it infects young babies, it acts a lot like respiratory syncytial virus. You get a lot of bronchiolitis, a lot of croup. You know, and 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 you do get low respiratory tract infection. So I would much rather her be vaccinated. Right. I will say that we see in, in my practice a ton more um, severe disease from RSV and human metanuma virus than we've seen from COVID. Again, I'm, ju I'm just telling you what I see. And so, we you know, see it all. We, I, yeah, I can say it, it, it's, we see it all. I mean, I think now you have a lot of population immunity for a virus where you really are protected against severe disease. Uh, it's really not true for flu. I mean, flu flu is a strange specific phenomenon. I mean, you 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 need to be vaccinated every year against flu because the, the immunization or natural infection the previous year really does not protect you against severe disease the following year. It doesn't, it's HA, hemogluten independent. It's a strange specific phenomenon. You need a flu vaccine every year. Um, we'll see what happens with RSV. Right. You know, we're about to have, uh, we now have two RSV vaccines for those over 60 years of age. Um, which are likely to be recommended uh, in a couple weeks by the ACIP. So, so we'll see what happens with that. But COVID, um, you know, COVID, you're protected against severe disease. I think likely for years. I mean, I had three doses of a vaccine and one natural infection. I think I'm done at least for a while for with the. I didn't get the bivalent booster because I think I'm protected. And I wrote a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine basically to say that, that I think, you know, we, this sort of notion of, of treating coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID, like flu is just wrong. This is not flu. This is the, the let me try and take a step back. The original vaccine was to protect the, against the ancestral strain, right? The Wuhan one strain. That's the, that's the vaccine we all got. Then, then last year they had the, um, you know, the bivalent vaccine. Um, which was no better than the monovalent vaccine. I mean, it, it's no worse. I mean, boosters boost, but it was um, it wasn't really much of an advance because because of something called original antigenic sin. It just was no better. Um, but but did everybody really need that? Because while it is true that this virus does 
mutate, all viruses mutate, and it does evolve in terms of getting immune evasiveness. It is Omicron and the Omicron sublineages are all immune evasive. It's true. But by immune evasive, what I mean is evasive for protection against mild disease. So even if you've been naturally infected or vaccinated with that Wuhan 1 strain, you could still get a mild disease a, a, a few weeks later. Um, but the, the, the part of your immune system that protects you against severe disease is T cells primarily something called cytotoxic T cells and also T helper cells. And this is just shown again and again and again. Well, the, 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 the regions recognized by T cells are different than those recognized by antibodies, much different, and they're much more conserved. So if you take Wuhan 1 and go all the way up now to XBB15 or XBB116, there's 85% conservation. So those are really the same viruses. So you're still protected against severe disease. I mean, hopefully we will not see a virus that evolves away from T cell recognition. If that's true, then we're, we're starting all over again. But this isn't flu. Flu you, is a strange specific phenomenon. That's not this, this, this virus because if the XBB, you know, on next week, next Thursday, our FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee will meet to discuss the, the this year's vaccine. But again, um, even if you just got the Wuhan 1 strain again, you're gonna be protected against severe disease. So you don't think we're going to have an annual COVID shot? I, I hope not. I, I think that there are those who may benefit from an a, annual COVID vaccine who are over 75, mm -hmm. multiple health problems, immune compromised. But even there, they're not. My mother is 94. She got her COVID booster. Do I think that's making much of a difference in her? No. I think she's older. She, her immune system is relatively senescent. Um, I think for people like that, <laughs> the most important thing is to make sure that in the first few days you take an antiviral. Right. And that's far more important if, you're, if you have the virus than if you're than uh, the vaccine. I do. We keep boosting and boosting. I, I think it's incumbent upon the CDC to really tell us who's getting hospitalized and who's dying. Right. I mean, last week, I think we had eight thousand hospitalizations and a handful of deaths. I think we're the the numbers. I think the real numbers are way down. Right. This is really good to hear because I think there's still people out there who are older and are are, are really they're still really worried. Right. And so I, sure. I think it's good to hear that we have, we do have more vaccines, but we also have really good antivirals. Well, and I think she should be, I think my mother should be worried. I mean, yeah. she's an older person. She's less capable of fighting this virus, but I think the Paxlovid would probably be of greater benefit to her than this. And I think I, I occasionally speak to adult education groups and, and they're worried and, and I'm glad they're right. worried. They should be worried about this virus. They should be worried about flu. They should be worried right. about RSV for which there will now be a vaccine probably in the next uh, couple months. So, um, and that's okay. So we have, we have a vaccine and, and be careful over the winter. I think it, 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 the, the dust settles on all this. Here's, here's what, what I would recommend. If you have respiratory symptoms, congestion, cough, runny nose, headache, fatigue, chills, you know, low grade fever, and you're in a high risk group, test yourself to see if you have COVID. If you have COVID, treat yourself with an antiviral. If you're not in a high risk group, don't test yourself. Assume that you have COVID, RSV, flu, or, any, or human metanumaviruses, any of these viruses, parainfluenza, that can cause people to be hospitalized and die, because they all can do that. So now you you have a virus that can kill other people, okay? Um, and have respect for that. Stay home if you can. If you can't stay home, wear a mask. And I think most people aren't going to do that. But, but now the sort of the theme is, well, I have a, this respiratory symptom, but it's not COVID, so now I can go out and I'm, I'm good. I can send my kids to school, I can go to work and, you know, infect other people with this virus. I would love if we have a little time to talk a little bit about what you wrote about in Bad Advice, because I think one of the problems we're in right now is we also have a lot of distrust of the mainstream, and then that makes people more vulnerable to charismatic people who may not be giving us evidence-based advice. Yeah, no, it's always about the data, but but unfortunately, sadly, it's more about uh, the the charisma of someone who's presenting data. So, in other words, if someone is a um, is not terribly charismatic and has great data, they they may be less influential than somebody who's quite charismatic but is promoting poor data. I mean, you know, looks look, look somebody like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I mean, he's he's an anti-vaccine activist. He puts terrible information out there about vaccines, but he's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I mean, that is the he's he's a part of an iconic Democratic family, and and that that you know that influences people sadly to make bad decisions. Um, and so, what to do? I mean, I do think that there are a lot of good sources of information out there, whether they're university associated or hospital associated or professional society associated. 
there's a lot of good sources of information out there, but there's also a lot of bad sources of information. So how do you distinguish the two? Um, I do think that 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 um, to say, well, you know, the CDC occasionally got things wrong or the FDA occasionally got things wrong. Therefore, I'm not going to trust any of them is a mistake. I do. Right. But it's hard for people to know who to trust. Right. It's, it's really hard. No, I agree. I think it's hard to know. Yeah. I, think you trust, I think you should, as a general rule, trust your doctor and your nurse to give you good information. I don't see why you should trust somebody who's has no experience or expertise in the area, why that is the person who should be trusted. But that, that just doesn't work in the 21st century, right? Trust us, we're experts. It's not exactly- a Right, follow the anything. science, right? But I, I love how you wrote, you know, don't follow the scientists, follow the science. That's right. But how are right? you supposed to know? I mean, I'll have, when the varicella chickenpox vaccine came out in 1995, you know, I would have people email me and call me and go, you know, I've, I've done my research and I'm not getting this vaccine. Well, if you've done your research, you'd get the vaccine every time. But what they mean by I've done my research is that they looked on the internet and got people's opinions about the, the chickenpox vaccine. If you really want to do your research at that time, read the 300 articles that have been published on the subject, which would mean that you would have to have had an expertise at some level in virology, immunology, epidemiology, statistics. Most people don't have that expertise. Most doctors don't have that expertise. So what do, who do they rely on? They rely on at least advisory groups that collect collectively have that expertise, like those at the FDA or CDC. And I think, unfortunately, there's been a real, sadly, a real erosion of trust, because I think it's a, we're just in a time right now where there's an attack on institutions. It's not just the CDC and the FDA, it's the FBI, it's the Department of Justice, it's the Internal Revenue Service. And we're just in this, I feel like politically, um, that's happened. We've gone to sort of like the, um, the less government under Reagan to the um, to the kind of no government under the Tea Party to like anti-government under the Freedom Caucus. It's like this attack on all government uh, agencies and we suffer this. Right, right. What would you say to physicians and other healthcare clinicians who are fighting this distrust? Because that, that's a really good answer to lay people, right? What about to me? <laughs> what about to my colleagues? So you fight the good fight. I mean, I think the, the, the challenge is that you have to be able to, it's perfectly reasonable to have a question about a vaccine. I'm right, my child was fine. They got a vaccine. Now they're not fine. Could the vaccine have done that? Fair question. Here's how you would answer that question. I mean, this was the MMR vaccine causes autism story, right? How would you know whether or not the MMR vaccine causes autism? Because there are children who are going to get that vaccine who are going to develop autism because the MMR vaccine is only designed to prevent measles, mumps, and rubella infection. It's not designed to prevent everything else that happens in life. So there are going to be those people who get an MMR, MMR vaccine who are in a car accident or who, you know, who, who you know, score badly during, don't, don't play well during a basketball game. I mean, all those things are going to happen. So, so how do you do it? You, you, look at peop, you, 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 you look at people who did or didn't get that vaccine and make sure that those two groups are alike in all other aspects in terms of their socioeconomic background, or medical history, or healthcare-seeking behavior, so that you can isolate the effect of that variable the variable being receipt of the vaccine. Are you more likely to develop autism if you've gotten the vaccine than if you hadn't? And the answer was no. Right. I mean, the original paper was just essentially eight children who got vaccinated who then got autism. Well, what did that prove? It proved the MMR vaccine doesn't prevent autism. It doesn't prevent a lot of things. It only prevents measles, mumps, and rubella infection. So I think trying to get people to understand how you would think about that, right? I mean, the rooster crows, the sun comes up. The rooster crows, the sun comes up. Is the rooster causing the sun to come up? I don't know if that experiment's ever been done, but I'm going to guess it's not. You know, the rooster is not causing the sun to come up. Right. That's a really good explanation. I have to thank you so much for doing this with me. I really, I, it's such an incredible honor. I'm a little overwhelmed. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Well, fight the good fight. It's you're on the fuss. It's easy for me. I'm on the back lines here. I mean, although I we consult on in, I consult on inpatients. Our division consults on inpatients. I'm, my yeah. wife's in private practice pediatric. I mean, she's on the front lines, and that's okay. much much harder. I just I think the level of distrust, the level of misinformation out there, the I think the the age of the internet and social media has made it much much harder to get good information out there than than when I was training. Much harder. So it's, it's, and it's the challenge because your job, especially as a pediatrician, is to protect the child. And, you know, the parent often has terrible information that puts their child at, at risk. And it's really, really frustrating. Right. But they're scared and they love their kids and they just want to do what's best for them. And I'm going to put out a plea to just listen and don't judge and don't just like preach at people because they all want what's best for their kids, really. 
Of course, and and but I, I just say this plea that occasionally the CDC will get it wrong or the FDA might get it wrong. It doesn't mean that you should never trust them again. Right, right, right. Good luck to all of us. That's all I have to say. <laughs> no, I know when I was training, uh, you know, like 100 years ago in pediatrics in the late 70s at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, you know, I learned from my senior pediatricians at the time that when a baby feeds, that you should lie them on their stomach after they've eaten because that way they won't regurgitate right. their food back into the windpipe or into the lung. Bad advice. I mean, as we su subsequently learned um, that that increased the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. And in the early 90s, the AAP launched their, you know, back to sleep program, meaning put the child on their back, not on their stomach. And the instance of sudden infant death syndrome plummeted. That didn't mean that I should never trust those senior pediatricians again. It just meant that we learn as we go. I think we learned as we went with the masks in terms of, I remember right. the CDC was looking at, at intestinal spread of this virus. It's not because they were ill-informed or stupid. They were just, were just learning about this new virus and this new disease. And, and, and that, that I just think you have to, yeah, I think if you ask people, do you think we're going to know more about science and medicine a hundred years from now? I think everybody would say yes. But right. when it comes to their disease, they want you to believe that you know everything you need to know right now, which right. is pretty ne much never true. Right. We all want certainty, but you can't necessarily have that. And, and we're seduced by that. We're yeah. seduced by people who are certain. Right. We're seduced by the Andrew Wakefields or the Deepak right. Chopras, you know, who or the Mehmet Oz's, you know, who are right. certain. They're certain, like, you know, the, the Bones McCoy phenomenon, seduction, which is, right. you, know, you know, he scans you up and down with his tricorder, <laughs> right. you know, whoever watched Star Trek. And that's what you had. I mean, what could be more seductive? Right. Especially now, right? So <laughs> I want to thank you so much. This has been sure. amazing. I really appreciate it. Thank you and be My well. Pleasure. Good you luck. Too. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at Joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.